Good evening and welcome to the fourth Sustainable Supper hosted by Antioch University, Los Angeles, Department of Urban Sustainability. Before I get into our wonderful menu, I would just like to introduce myself. I'm Clarence R. Williams. I am one of the host chefs for this evening, cleverly disguised as a student in the Department of Urban Sustainability. <laughs> I would like to welcome two other chef hosts, Ms. Lupe Romero and Mariana Mendoza. They're gonna serve up a bit of language justice to get us started. Just a small appetizer. Gracias, Clarence. Hola a todos el día de hoy. Mi nombre es Mariana Mendoza. Respondo a ella o Mariana. Y hoy estaré interpretando con mi colega Lupe. Eh, estamos hoy para interpretar entre español e inglés. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Mariana. I use the pronouns she, her. And I'm with my colleague uh, Lupe today to interpret between Spanish and English today. La justicia del lenguaje incluye el derecho que todos tenemos de comunicar en nuestros idiomas y un respeto igual a los derechos lingüísticos de todos los pueblos. Quisiera comenzar reconociendo que eh, hay muchos idiomas presentes aquí el día de hoy y también quisiera reconocer los idiomas de los pueblos indígenas de esta tierra. Language justice includes the right that everyone has to communicate in our languages and a respect for the languages' rights of all peoples. I want to begin by acknowledging all the languages here today, as well as the languages of the indigenous people of this land. Hoy este evento se llevará a cabo en español e inglés. Se usarán ambos idiomas activamente. Así que si usted no está cómodo comunicándose en ambos idiomas, podrá elegir un canal para su idioma en unos pocos minutos. Después de que hayamos explicado cómo funcionará la interpretación. Today, this meeting will be held in Spanish and English. Both languages will be actively used. So if you're not comfortable communicating in both, you'll choose a language channel in a few minutes after we explain to you how the Zoom interpretation feature works. Estaremos usando la función de interpretación de Zoom. Eh, que es para cualquier persona que no se sienta igualmente cómoda en inglés y español. Entonces... We'll, perdón. We'll be using the Zoom interpretation function, which is for anyone who is uncomfortable uh, hearing both in English and Spanish. Ahorita la vamos a activar en unos momentos, todavía no, pero cuando la activemos van a ver un icono de mundo en la parte inferior de su pantalla. In a couple of minutes, not quite yet, but in a couple of minutes, we'll activate the Zoom interpretation function and you'll see an icon at the bottom of the screen. It looks like a globe that says interpretation. Si usted está conectado con su tableta o teléfono, eh, puede hacer clic en más y, y luego interpretación de idiomas. Si usted no puede ver el mundo o la opción de interpretación de idiomas, aunque este, aún después de que ya la hayamos activado, por favor pónganse en contacto con el facilitador de logística. Eh, no sé si sea quizás... Eh, Harold, ¿no? Harold, eh, no. para recibir ayuda. Ok, so, uh, if you're on, if you're in a laptop, you'll see the globe icon and then you click Spanish or English. But if you're in a phone or in a tablet, you will see a menu at the bottom left, bottom right of your phone or three little dots. You click there. And then you'll see a menu pops up that says language interpretation. You click English or Spanish. Make sure to click done. And then you'll be able to access the interpretation and hear the meeting in the language of your preference. Can you hear us? Mariana, ¿sí me escucha? Mariana, you hear me? Okay. Um, I think if you can hear us, uh, if you can um, not assign me as an interpreter yet.
Uh, Harold, do you hear uh, Mariana's request to not assign her yet, please? Mariana, how are we doing? Um, yeah, I think the the um, the interpretation has been turned off. Um, yeah, if you if you can wait one second. Oh, no, oh. back again. Um, yeah, not yet. I shouldn't be assigned as an interpreter yet. Thanks for your patience, folks. We'll sort this out in a moment. This is part of figuring out how to um, create uh, language justice. Esto es un ejemplo de cómo crear justicia de lenguaje. Bueno, para escuchar la interpretación, usted va a pulsar el icono de mundo o interpretación de idiomas. Y a continuación, usted va a elegir su canal de idioma. Sure, I'll finish explaining English. So now I think you're able to see the globe um, either in your computer or your tablet. And uh, to hear interpretation, please click on the icon and you can now choose your, um, the, your preferred language. Ahora estamos haciendo interpretación consecutiva, pero empezaremos con la interpretación simultánea en un momento. Uh, we are doing consecutive interpretation right now, but we will start doing simultaneous interpretation in just a moment. So uh, now we're gonna start. I think Lupe, have you been assigned as an interpreter now? Okay. Uh, we're going to do our test in, uh, in Spanish. Can someone go to the Spanish interpretation just to make sure it's working? Maybe some thumbs up. Okay, great. Ahora vamos a hacer la, inter la, eh, la prueba en interpretación en inglés. Si alguien está ahí, puede escuchar. Perfecto. Okay. Right. Y, y quería decir que todas las personas que prefieran participar en un solo idioma entonces deben de estar en un canal de idioma. Si se sienten cómodos en español e inglés, pueden dejar la función de interpretación apagada o elegir un canal de idioma. Si usted elige un canal de idioma, Por favor, hable solamente en ese idioma, porque eso les, les facilita a los intérpretes. Y queríamos comentar que la comunicación equitativa en un espacio bilingüe es la responsabilidad de todos. Esto, eh, ahorita voy a mencionar unas cosas en las que usted puede ayudar. Por ejemplo, por favor, silencie su micrófono cuando no está hablando. Eh, esté al pendiente de comunicaciones de le facilitadore, de logística y de otros intérpretes en caso de que tengan que pedirle que haga una pausa o que hable más despacio. Por favor, hable a un ritmo moderado y haga pausas con frecuencia, sobre todo entre las Especially personas. between people that speak in, in different languages. When more than one person talks, it's impossible to interpret. Please say your name before speaking each time that you speak so that people can hear uh, who the interpreter is interpreting. And if you have a problem, please don't suffer in silence. Contact the person dedicated to technology or the interpreters immediately if you cannot hear the interpretation. 
And then, thank you very much. And now we're going to pass it to Jane or, or to Clarence. Okay, thank you, Seth. That was the wonderful, wonderful, interesting, you know, offering. You know, sometimes, you know, when you have appetizers, you know, it takes longer to, to create and to curate. So thank you guys for that. As I said earlier, this is our fourth sustainable supper here at Antioch. And normally we would be in room 1000 on the campus located at 400 Corporate Point, Culver City, California. And we would be in room 1000. And just outside of that room is our declaration of where we are, of our territory. So please allow me to serve up just the statement that you would have been greeted with had we been in room 1000 at our wonderful campus. But we hold these words to be truth wherever we are. So Antioch University Los Angeles resides on Tonga, the traditional and unceded territory of the Tonga people. These lands and the Tonga people continue to carry the stories of this nation and the people's struggle for survival and identity. We are committed to learning those stories and identifying ways to join in decolonial and indigenous movements for sovereignty and self-determination. So in this moment tonight, since we're not in room 1000, I ask you to just imagine all of us orbiting now in this Zoom universe in the age of COVID-19. I'd like for you to just kind of circle your tables side by side, socially distancing, of course, and enjoy the wonderful centerpiece on your tables that our wonderful creative director, Lupe, I'm sorry, Monique Lopez has designed for us. It, the centerpiece has a wonderful complexity illustrating housing and housing is our preferred and celebrated cuisine tonight. So we are recording, we've been recording. So if you're in the witness protection program like me, you might wanna turn your screen off or you could simply um, you know, name yourself something else. Um, I think some aliases were already present when you enter the room. And we kind of sort of apologize for that, but anyway, it gave you something to do while we were handling all of those technical issues. Now, I would like to also remind you to take good care of yourself. We've got a five course meal designed and curated for you by many of our wonderful guest chefs and some of our standard chefs that are here on campus. I'd like to also ask you to take very good care of yourself, which is a mantra that we often use during this time of COVID-19. And um, grab your drink of choice. We're gonna serve up a few more appetizers and um, we're going to enjoy this wonderful supper that I hope will incite, inform and nourish you as we move forward. I would like to at this moment invite another one of our chef host, who is cleverly designed as a professor in our department. His name is Gopal. Welcome, Gopal. Thank you, Clarence. Um, thank you, um, everyone, for joining us uh, today for the Sustainable Supper. Um, as Clarence mentioned, this is the, the, the fourth of this, of this cohort or this, um, you know, this groups. Uh, um, and um, Jane can correct me, but I think we've been doing it for a while now. Um, but it's really exciting to be have this one is special because um, the students were really deeply involved in curating and designing it. So I just wanted to name that. Um, um, I'm very um, excited and honored to be here to um, help frame our conversation today um, between Fanny Ortiz and um, Rob Robinson. Who I've had the wonderful opportunity to um, organize with over the years around this question of housing. Um, and I want to start by saying that um, we cannot have a conversation about housing without first having a conversation about land. And we cannot have a conversation about land without first having a conversation about settler colonialism, enslavement, 
dispossession and displacement of peoples from their lands and the displacement of, of lands from their peoples. And it is um, the combination of those two forces and the enclosure of the commons and the separation of land from home, from housing, that is part and parcel of how we ended up in the kind of deep housing um, and uh, houselessness crisis that we're in. Um, I wanna just quickly say, when I say dispossession, I mean, the forced, um, the forced removal of people from uh, control over their sovereign territories. Um, uh, this is the, from the doctrine of discovery and Tierra Nullius, these ideas that, that, um, that um, you, can, you are entitled to take any land that is not occupied by a people, which forced the question of who gets to be people. And so indigenous peoples um, were categorically excluded from personhood in the project of settler colonialism. And that, that is the first drop of poison that leads to the housing crisis today. We cannot think of the housing crisis as separate from that. When I say, uh, when I say dislocation and displacement, I am talking about both the removal of people forcibly from their home in the form of enslavement and the kind of economic forces that drive people away from their homes that results in forced migration. All of these are part and parcel of how we have to think about land and housing. And I wanna offer um, two quick frames and I wanna apologize for all the students or anybody who's been forced to hear me speak before because I'm a little bit of a one trick pony on this subject. But I wanna ask you all to just raise your hand if you believe housing is a human right. Great, we don't have any outliers here. Um, if you believe that housing is a fundamental human right, then all economic activity must be subordinate to that right. That's the meaning of the term right. Anything which, is in, which infringes upon that right, which violates that right is a form of violence. And so this fundamental question of the right to housing, the fundamental human right to housing ultimately becomes a question of how we organize our economic relationships. And currently we subordinate housing to the interests of property and ownership and enclosure. And our panelists today are gonna to talk about all of the work that they're doing to, um, to upend those enclosures, to break those enclosures open and to create opportunities for housing that um, are not, that in which the right to housing comes before um, profit-making and economic interests. The last thing I wanna say, and then I'm gonna hand it over to um, our wonderful host for our session today and who helped curate and bring this together, Jane Paul. Um, uh, I just um, wanna also make a quick note on language. Um, uh, we had this conversation in, in our prep, and so I just wanted to surface it. Many of us um, in who have been working on um, housing, um, uh, there's, a, there's a movement to use the language of um, houselessness and unhoused versus um, homeless or homelessness. And all of them are meaningful terms, and how we use them is, um, is you know, it may be, be a lot about how we came up in the movement or our own personal experiences. But I wanna speak a little bit to um, the idea of, the, of these um, terms um, because I think an important aspect of the movement to use the term um, unhoused or houseless rather than homeless is in recognition of the complex social, cultural, community relationships that unhoused people have and build and create and maintain in order to have that sense of community and belonging, despite the fact that there, that there is an imposed economic um, regime that makes them unhoused. And so one way I think about it is um, soil plus story makes um, 
makes place and soil plus story plus sacredness makes home. And the colonial project comes and sees, seizes a territory, tells a story about it and makes it a place, but the colonial mind will forever be homeless because instead of seeing a forest as kin, sees timber waiting to be felled. And so one could argue that the true homelessness is in the colonial expansion and the seizing of territory and the unhousing of people. So that distinction between houselessness and, um, and homelessness, often we can use it as an opportunity to reflect on what relationships are valued and, and how we organize our communities. So I'm gonna stop there because I really wanna pass it over to Jane and let the conversation begin. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Gopal. That was beautiful and super helpful. Thank you so much. So, um, and thank you to our team. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you, Harold. Thank you to our team um, for organizing and thank you especially to um, our two esteemed guests today, although you're all guests, but our speakers, Rob Robinson and Fanny Ortiz for joining us. So before we begin with Fanny, I just wanna let you know a couple of quick things. We do have an abbreviated list of resources, uh, sort of a reader on these topics. Um, we also have uh, some bios, things that we might've had once upon a time in print. And the, uh, the folks in the Linda and Gopal will um, drop those into the chat and send those links to you as, as well as we'll send them out to you tomorrow. Um, and about the chat, please put questions in. Again, we're gonna try to um, pull those out and um, in a little bit, we'll get to your questions. So um, to start the conversation, I'm honored to introduce to you Fanny Ortiz. Fanny is a remarkable community leader. Um, she's a renter. Fanny is a renter in Boyle Heights. She's an organizer with the Community Power Collective, which you'll learn more about. Fanny was elected to the Neighborhood Council and is co-president of Fide Comiso Comentario Tierra Libre. Apologies for my uh, poor Spanish. However, that is the first community land trust on the east side. Um, but none of those things really describe the deep and impactful work that Fanny does every day. So I'm gonna let her tell you about that. Um, and then in a bit, we'll get to some questions. Go ahead, Fanny, please. Hi, everybody. Again, my name is Fanny Ortiz. I was born and raised all over California, but I was born actually in Bowl Heights. Um, so I have quite an experience being displaced. And it goes back to, to, you know, colonization, you know, and forced migration as well. And, and I do not understand it's like I learned something new from Gopal. Um, you know, having that colonial mindset, thinking that you're always going to be homeless, but home is wherever you make it. Um, and I, you know, growing up here in Bowl Heights and all over California, I felt like I never belonged because I was, even though I was privileged to be born here, I never felt like I belonged um, until I decided to uh, activate myself as a community leader, a community organizer in Bowl Heights. And I realized that what I was missing all along was, you know, that connection with, with my roots. Um, and because I, I learning from the work that uh, previous community leaders were doing in the community, I started engaging once I lost my home, I was displaced. Um, I'm a single mother of five with my youngest of special needs. And um, even though I was working full time back in the day, I was working for Metro. Um, I wasn't developing my capacity as a, as a person. And so I started learning about the work that Metro was doing to uh, develop Metro rail lines all throughout the city of LA. And they had started here in Bowl Heights. Um, they left um, empty lots and they took away a lot of housing that was under rent control. And so I started, you know, I was afraid to be part of that work because I worked for them. Um, but I was excited to see that the people were like, you know, out there, you know, making sure that Metro was being held accountable for what they were doing in our community. 
and what they were getting ready to do with their master plan to develop Braille. And as we see, it's been happening all throughout the city of LA. Um, and so after the huge win in back in 2014 of um, advocating for a specific lot that's right across from where I live in the historical hotel building, the Cummings Block building, uh, at Mariachi Plaza, they Metro wanted to tell us what they were gonna develop and didn't bother doing a community engagement with us as community. Um, and so we all organized and we said no. So it was a historical win. Um, so it set precedence on the work that Metro was gonna be doing in the future, which is happening now. They have to engage with communities and not just come and develop whatever they feel uh, should be placed uh, after displacing homes that were under rent control or small businesses. Um, and we also, I think what was the most uh, the most impactful win for me was that for Metro to recognize that even though they were not in the business of developing housing, um, their work was displacing housing and displacing community. So they were accountable. They should be held accountable for the work that they're doing. And so now uh, we won, we made sure that all 10 lots here in Boa Heights were gonna be developing a uh, mixed development, which included, we includes affordable housing. Um, and at Mariachi specifically, it's very special to me because um, we also want make, we want to make sure that they develop um, a green space, a community garden. Um, being here in Bowl Heights, surrounded by freeways, we're the epic center of um, waste. You know, we have um, four freeways surrounding us, and then we also have um, the Excite battery that was, you know, functioning on a, a permit for 35 plus years. And so, um, knowing that and knowing that the largest green space here in Bowl Heights is the cemetery. <laughs> You know, uh, we're like, no, we need more green space. We need to be able to grow our food. Um, we need to be able to practice what our ancestors used to do, which is having food sovereignty. sovereignty. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's why I have persisted in being a community leader and making sure that after winning um, and making sure that those lots were gonna be utilized for affordable housing, uh, we decided that we needed something else because we were not going to be owners of the land. At the end of the day, the land would still belong to Metro. Um, and so that's how the CLT came about. Community Land Trust um, and Fidecomiso Comunitario Tierra Libre was created back in 2018 um, by community leaders who have been fighting for years um, and advocating for affordable housing. But now we want to um, have a uh, community ownership of the land and um, making sure that we can acquire buildings and land and take care of it in a collective manner. And I use it as an extractive form that, you know, it has been historically been done, um, you know, just extracting wealth out of the working class people um, and not having a home to live with dignity. Yeah. Would you like your slides, Fanny? I'm sorry. Sure, please. <laughs> So this is just a very short, um, I don't know if you want to put it in presentation mode, but this is just uh, a brief, um, you know, history about community land trust, uh, CLTs uh, for short are nonprofit organizations that are permanently used to acquire, hold and develop on land in and for specific geographically areas for communities. Um, and the CLTs require the participation of tenants, homeowners, and members of the community. Um, so um, the work between tenants and CLTs is a process of acquiring buildings and, and land uh, make it easier for us. We can um, engage in actions um, and work collectively with um, coalitions. Um, also, the partnership between tenants and CLTs guarantee that housing remains affordable and is controlled by community permanently. So we, um, so we can work with different um, different buildings like single family homes, limited um, 
equity housing co-ops, condominiums, multifamily rentals. But in order to acquire buildings like this, we need funding. Um, we can go up to the next slide. Um, as you know, we have 240 CLTs in the entire US. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. Um, the next slide, please. So out of 240, go back, please, I'm sorry. We have uh, 33 CLTs in California. Out of 33, 30 of them are part of the California CLT network, uh, which Fidecomiso Comunitario is a member and a board member as well. Um, and so let's go to the next one, yeah. Uh, out of the, and then we have the local five CLTs. And just to go back a little bit into the historical context, maybe like about 15 years ago, there were only two CLTs that were around. Um, but right at the beginning of the pandemic, we expanded to five CLTs, which are the five CLTs that started the Los Angeles Community Land Trust Coalition in LA. And as you can see, we are geographically all around um, covering all the areas. And that's uh, El Sereno CLT, Fidecomiso Comunitario Tierra Libre, Liberty CLT, which is in the Crenshaw area, and Beverly, Vermont CLT, which uh, focuses in um, Little Tokyo, a small part of South LA. Um, and then we also have uh, Trust of LA, um, who is the oldest CLT. Um, I think it's important to also mention that three out of the five CLTs here are members of the California CLT network, um, including again, Fidecomiso. We can go to the next one. Mm -hmm. So um, I am the co-founder, board member, um, and currently I'm no longer the co-president, but I'm currently the uh, organizer for Fidecomiso Comunitario Tierra Libre. Um, I like the flexibility of moving around. Um, and I, I think it's important to engage with community. Um, let's go to the next one. Fidecomiso is the first CLT in the east side. It is a grassroots uh, founded CLT and it's predominantly led by women of color. Uh, the majority of the women are in the group are monolingual and they're part of the non-informal economy. We are intentionally disrupting the narrative of the extractive tenant landlord relationship by deliberately addressing the historical inequities that have impacted our communities politically and economically. Um, so tenants are engaging in the decision-making process in a democratic way. Um, you know, um, so by taking land and housing off the specular market, we are transforming the extractive real estate practices and challenging existing assumptions that are brought about gentrification and displacement that portray it as positive. Next slide, please. Um, so I did it both in English and Spanish, trying to do the language justice. <laughs> Next one, please. Um, so this, this is a little bit of the historical context of Lo, the Los Angeles CLT coalition. Um, all five CLTs are aligned in the commodifying housing and making it affordable in the long run. Uh, we are also aligned in community ownership and community control to protect, reclaim, remain, and invest in our communities. Um, we can go to the next one. So as a coalition, we have fundraised collectively a little bit over uh, $1.5 million. We also won $14 million for the, from uh, a program, a pilot program from the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Um, and we're working every day to bring the funding and resources directly to our communities for capacity building to acquire land and buildings and implement policies that will support and fund CLTs. Um, so on this, a huge side note, uh, all five CLTs are in the middle of acquiring um, buildings with this uh, LA County pilot program um, that was approved back in November of 2020. Um, so the LA CLT coalition has launched the Local Tenants Opportunity to Purchase Act or TOPA campaign in the County of LA. Uh, this policy would empower um, tenants to have the first opportunity to buy the rental property they live in and if and when the owner decides to sell. 
Um, I think the most important thing to highlight is that the policy and the fundraising work um, are a huge win and it wouldn't have been possible unless we were working the way we're doing it as a cohesive and mutual work uh, collectively. Uh, we're working regionally and statewide as we are learning and supporting from each other um, and supporting other emergency OTs. Um, I believe that we are firmly emerging a CLT ecosystem to protect, repair, invest, and transform our communities. Um, yeah, that's that's all I have for right now. I'll save the rest for questions. You're muted, Jane. Of course. So, <laughs> so thank you so much, Fanny. This is beautiful. Uh, so much. Uh, it's an action-packed kind of uh intense a lot to um to process so we're gonna go to rob uh for a little bit he's gonna also lay some groundwork for us on his work and then we'll have a couple of questions and and i hope hope folks are putting um any thoughts and and questions in the chat for us to um to bring up to to fanny and rob so thank you so much um Okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce my friend, Rob Robinson. Rob was a co-founder and member of the leadership committee of the Take Back the Land movement. Some of you all might remember that. Uh, and is currently a staff volunteer at Partners for Dignity and Rights, formerly known as Nesri. Um, Rob is also much better at describing his powerful work than I could be. So Rob, please tell us about you. Thank you, Jane. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I want to congratulate Fanny and all the folks involved in the CLT. It is a model that I believed in from my days working, doing the work of Take Back the Land. But I'll, I'll say I do have some criticisms of that and not in Fanny's work in particular, but of the model in particular. And it's just, you know, Fanny gave us a number of 240 and the question I keep raising to folks around the country is why aren't there more if it's such a great model? And I think that's something that we have to, we have to peel back the onion and try to understand as we move forward. But Fanny also dropped a couple of other things that impressed me. Um, transformation. Um, a lot of times you hear people talking about reforming. No, I don't want to, I don't want to put a band-aid on a broken system. I want to transform the system. I want to totally change it. I have a vision of a new system. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. I really enjoyed the presentation. I don't have a fancy PowerPoint like Fanny. Um, I'm blessed to come to webinars like this on a regular basis. So I'm pretty used to speaking publicly like this. And you know, before I move forward again, a, a lot of thank yous to to Jane, I met Jane through Gilda Haas, somebody I've known a long time and has been a mentor for me. Um, uh, Gopal and I worked together when we were doing the work of Take Back the Land. So I, I'm somebody who came from a working class family, never did organizing, um, was raised to believe in the American dream. And then all of a sudden I found myself homeless on the streets of Miami in, 2003 to 2005, 2006. And then once I found myself back from Miami, I'm from New York, basically, lived in New York all my life. Uh, just a quick, how did, it, how did that happen? Well, I worked for Automatic Data Processing, ADP, the payroll company for 13 years in New York. Worked myself up from taking payrolls from small companies over the phone to becoming a project manager overseeing a piece of software that ADP said would move it into the new millennium. And I was called the power user of this piece of software. And they asked me to move to Miami in uh, March of 2001. Um, I was honored. ADP had 60,000 employees worldwide at the time and very few people of color and high level management. So I was honored. I picked up my life with very little notice, moved to Miami, March 2001, July 2001. I was called into the general manager's office and told there's no more money in the organization for your position. We're going to have to let you go. It was basically a brain dump. Squeeze his brain for what he knows about this piece of software. 
and you know we'll benefit and we'll find somebody to do it cheaper that's the bottom line right when you look back at it um, but I was a confident individual I thought I could find work right I worked my way up through ADP but Miami was going through tough economic times in the early 2000s there was no work and I, I love to share the story I was so desperate at one point that I went to a Kmart looking for a job and the manager read my resume and he asked me what my salary was at ADP. And when he broke it down, he said, that's like $40 an hour. His response to me was, I could get two Cubans and a Haitian for that amount of money. And I said, this world is messed up, man. This world is really messed up. I was lucky enough to find my way back to New York City spent 10 months in a New York City homeless shelter. But just before I left Miami, I'm starting to hear this word gentrification. And when I got to New York, I kept hearing a lot more about gentrification and trying to understand what it was based on my lived experience and what I was seeing. Um, it was an interesting time. New York was starting to go through what we call rezonings using the process of gentrification. But I took my 10 months that I would otherwise would have sat in a shelter waiting for housing to go to the library every day to understand this phenomenon called gentrification. And through what I learned in the library and what I saw happening around people, I articulated at a conference in 2007 at Columbia University, and I made the following statement. Gentrification leads to displacement, which leads to homelessness, which leads to criminalization. And there was a distinguished professor of geography and anthropology from the City University of New York Graduate Center by the name of Neil Smith. I think you should look up his books and I will give you a couple of suggestions later on. Um, Neil stood up in the audience and looked at me and said, say that again. And I said it again. And he says, I want to see you after this. I want to know how you developed that theory. Well, I'll speed up my story a little bit. Neil eventually invited me to lunch. And Neil looked at me at lunch and said, I want you to come up to the Graduate Center and lecture my students. I looked at Neil and I said, I have an undergraduate degree. I can't lecture PhD students. Neil very sternly looked at me and said, you taught me you were going to teach my students. So I said, OK. A month later, I go to the Grad Center. I'm sitting in a room with 18 graduate students. Neil introduces me. They're all staring at me. I had prepared nothing, no readings or anything. And I sheepishly admitted that in the room. And Neil looked at me and said, it's not a problem, Rob. Make the statement that you made at Columbia University. And I guarantee you that that will engage these students in a conversation that you will never forget. I will say to this day, many of Neil's students from that class teach around the country and repeatedly bring me into their class to lecture their students from that point on. And there's a connection to you all out on the West Coast. Um, I'm sure you've all heard by now the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. Um, they work with groups in LA and in the Bay Area to map evictions that were taking place out there. And the one who started that group was one of Neil's students from his class at that time by the name of Manissa Monharal. And Manissa is the founder of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. And, you know, Manissa and I have a very strong relationship. She was a student then. She's teaching now in, in Boston, um, but it, it's just incredible how some of these things come full circle. But you fast forward, we're coming out of 2008, 2009, the financial crisis. There's a group in Miami doing work called Take Back the Land. I joined a group in New York City called Picture the Homeless, which was organizing homeless people. Those of you on the West Coast know LA Can. Um, LA Can's work is similar to the work of Picture the Homeless. So everybody at LA Can, Pete White, Steve Diaz, those are all comrades and basically fam. We've been working together for a long time. Um, but learning from groups like that and that work, I got to travel to Miami in 2009 and learn from a group called Take Back the Land, which was doing work down there, led by a gentleman by the name of Max Romo. And I know Gopal knows him well. And Max and I um, came back to New York and did a talk for PBS Now with Maria Hinojosa, and it just sparked wide, um, wide interest across the country. 
and we figured out how do we take this work nationally and in 2010 we launched take back the land national and that was the work that propelled me but i i say that and i want to go back to what i said about uh fanny and clts um one of the goals of take back the land was to elevate housing to a human right um community control over land and housing right because unless we control it we will you know we will always be at odd and i think you know gopal's opening talked about the economic situation that feeds into it yeah that's important right early on for me i didn't know how to articulate it but i would bang my hand on desk and talks and say we need to decommodify housing and we need to decommodify land but what I learned after the work of Take Back the Land and some of that sort of society, and I started to do a lot of theoretical work with universities was you'll never control the housing unless you control the land underneath it, right? And Gopal spoke so eloquently about colonialism and how uh, those practices were disrupted and land was taken away from indigenous folks. So I'll just say this, as we traveled around the country with the work of Take Back the Land, we always ask permission of indigenous groups in that particular place that we work to use the name take back the land understanding that settler uh, that relationship to land that existed long before we came along and we always met with our open arms and and um, the respect of doing that so fast forward to today i see time is running out i'm working a lot in new york city we just won a huge victory today right to counsel, which was something that started in New York where everybody gets a right to a lawyer and well, certain zip codes in the past had gotten a right to counsel in housing court. Today, our city council signed new legislation that anybody going into housing court, if you can't afford an attorney, one will be provided for you regardless of income levels which is huge. So everybody going into housing court, that dynamic is gonna change tremendously. And our courts are about to, well, our legislature on the state level is about to move our moratorium for evictions, which is gonna expire on Saturday, will be reinstated and last through August 31st. I bring that up because it is a much stronger protection than the federal motor moratorium that was issued by the federal government. So those are a few of the things I touched on. There's a lot more of international work, um, but I wanna be respectful of the time and give folks an opportunity to ask questions. So thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. Impactful. <laughs> thank you. So we do have a few questions formulated um, from our team um, for you both. And um, just thinking about our, our time, I think we're okay. Um, I have one or two questions for you individually, but I wanna ask you both first, um, because you've talked so much about the great work and what has happened, what's been done, accomplishments here with community land trusts, accomplishments with legislation in New York, yes, hometown, the mother country. And um, so, I, so both of you, whoever wants to answer first can, what's the biggest obstacle you have found? And I know you have a lifetime of work to talk about. So just talk about like right now, maybe to be helpful. What's the biggest obstacle? Mm -hmm. I would say not having access to funding as when it comes to CLT. Okay. We need uh, the resources. Um, we need to build capital. Fideicomiso, for example, it's on, we're just starting our third year and we had to uh, change the plans on, on three empty lots here in Ball Heights because we don't have access to funding. And so that's the biggest challenge for a community land trust. Yeah, so thank you, Fanny. Thank you for that. I know there's a lot of work folks are doing on trying to understand and build non-extractive finance resources. And that's really a challenge because if we look at sort of the traditional places that money might come from, you know, whether we want to go down the street to the bank, to the big banks, maybe, maybe not. So I understand that's a big challenge. Um, and then do the banks open the door and let you in also the other question. <laughs> um, thank you, Fanny, for that. So that's something we can, people say, what can I do to help later? We can tell them, talk I'm about gonna, 
Yeah, I would like to name two. I, I, I think Fanny is spot on with respect to funding. But I, Fanny, I think we make a misstep sometimes by not bringing economists, right? There are progressive economists into our work to help us through that process. So I work with a progressive economist by the name of Rick Wolf. And he talks about cooperatives and cooperative development. So different models, right? We need to bring those people into the fold. But I think for us here in New York City, and this is why I criticize a little bit the CLT movement, land has gotten so commodified in New York City that air rights are for sale. So our strongest uh, movement for CLT started in Manhattan. And my criticism to the, the greater movement is, who is going to give you land in Manhattan in perpetuity when air rights are going for $550 a square foot, right? We used to have uh, the doorman in our building where I'm sitting right now asked me this morning, where can he find a gas station in Manhattan? They don't exist because those areas are now zoned for 50 stories. So if you multiply $550 a square foot going up 50 stories, the money is just incredible. So it's a challenge. So we have to be, we really have to think strategically of where we go after land. And my argument is, I think the easiest entry point is publicly owned land, right? Um, that's what we need to push the government to create those models that we share with one another around the country. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, sharing, 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 right? Sharing the ideas. Share. I mean, it's wicked, the price of real estate land, real estate and asset, right? Some dudes call it assets, assets. No, actually, that's where I live, right? Um, but New, yeah, New York and LA selling air rights, uh, it's, um, it's gotten pretty kooky. And so there's a lot of different ways to approach that. And I appreciate the progressive economists idea because we're all about that. Um, and then, you know, we need the, the power of the coalitions that you both are working on, right? Get I think we would, I would add also add like policy in order to get to what Rob mentioned, we need policy change that would support that, you know, and so it, it goes hand in hand policy and funding that for yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Thank you so much. Policy legislation. That means walk in the halls of power. And again, not unlike the bank, you got to get they have to open the doors. Right, to open those halls. Um, so thank you. I want to just so two questions kind of about coalitions and, and the, the work that you all do, not individually. Um, so Fanny, you described the, the empowerment of renters and, and of shared ownership. And I just want to, um, you talked for one minute about TOPA, the tenant option. And that sounds to me like that expands the work and makes it um, more broadly available, right? So folks are not necessarily in your coalition. So can you just say what that tenant option is? The Tenant Opportunity Purchase Act, it's uh, just one strategic tool uh, to empower tenants to take community ownership of the buildings if and when the owner decides to sell. Uh, one, because it, it's gonna prevent displacement It'll help accumulate generational wealth. Um, and with the collective work with tenants and a community land trust, it'll, um, you know, it'll stabilize the housing market and, and keep it affordable in the long term. And then also when families have a home, they're help, they stay healthier. You know? um, but yeah, but, but Topa, Topa is just a, a one way of like, it's just a proposed law. And so we're specifically right now just proposing to pass it in the LA County. Um, but we're also are planning to pass, you know, at once it passes in the county, then we're gonna, uh, we're already doing the legwork to do it in the city of LA as well. And as a California CLT member, I know that we're also doing the work at the state level. Um, but um, we like for it might not happen this year because uh, we understand that the topa in our in that we're proposing right now at the regional level is much more stronger than in the state level. Um, so that's the the beauty of us working in coalitions and being sure that we're participating not only locally but in in, in statewide policies as well. 
Yeah, thank you. So, all right, that's really interesting. And I love the idea about the regional versus the statewide, right? We saw that with the street vendors, right? That we passed something in LA that then got moved to the state and they modeled it on, on the work done here. And I also love the idea that people in your community will see people taking advantage of that tenant opportunity and have a different view of what their community means and what ownership means and spatial justice, right? Of, of who owns who owns our spaces. So thank you. It's another way of reimagining and transforming our communities. Um, it's just one tool, but we still need to make sure that we have more policies to implement it and, and um, more funding. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I have a minute for one last question for Rob. Um, so Rob, you talked only quickly because there was not a lot of time about the international work. And so I hear you also working like on projects that are like block by block, and then you're working on New York and then you're nationally and then globally. So um, just say something about that international work and how you see like how is how is it possible that people work together and build consensus and that's hard right i think it it is hard but i think when you understand that um everybody contributes to the struggle right everybody brings something an idea a strategy a tactic whatever it is the work of of take back the land was inspirational to a lot of folks and there was a point where folks in Brazil reached out to a group in New York called Why Hunger? And the movement of people affected by dams reached out to an organizer from Brazil who's working with Why Hunger, living in New York, and said, do you know this guy? He's always talking about our relationship to land. We want to meet him. And they invited me to an encuentro. And what I learned from Mabi and folks in Latin America is the political education that happens. And it's a part of everyday organizing, which I can bring here. But, you know, I'm, I'm watching people who have a lot less than we do put up such a fierce fight in a struggle, right? And, you know, I, I've seen them. Land has to serve a social function in Brazil. That was fundamental, right? Like. So it got me thinking differently about our relationship to land. It has to be growing food. It has to be housing people. And so the MST, the largest social movement in the world, started moving at night and claiming land and starting the men, once they get in there, would start to plant food. Daylight comes, they take bamboo and they build a house. More people come, they build community. Before you know it, somebody in that community um, watches my children when I go to work, right? So when Fanny goes to work, I watch her children, right? And then all of a sudden, another person comes who can take the plants from the earth and heal the sick. Healthcare issues go away. So it became apparent to me land was centered to our struggle. If you have access to land, your life changes in so many ways. So, you know, it was, it was learning from these other movements. And then I think the other issue, I do a lot of work around human rights and what the, what the human right to housing means codified in treaties and international human rights law. And you push back on the US, a country that dismisses that, then you've got a real challenge, right? Because I get in the coalitions I work in, we challenge in courtrooms, we challenge a judge, and we challenge the lawyers to go in and say, you have a human right to a home. But we challenge the judge to say, you don't have, it. I dare you judge to, to be the, have the stenographer put that on the record, right? <laughs> Who wants to be the first judge to go on record saying you don't have a human right to a home? So how do we bring folks together and, and really understand how we can push and we can resist and we can build our own power, right? So it's, it's you know, the international work has given me a lot of ideas on how to do that. And I've been blessed to work with dynamite organizers from all over the world, different social movements, focused mostly in, in Brazil and in Africa, but the PA in Spain has been a big influence on me also, and I have a strong relationship with that group. Thank you so much. Yeah, the PA, I don't know if we could find a link to that video from the PA, which is incredible, but um, thank you, Rob, thank you. So that helps put it in perspective, right? Because world's still a big place, right? Even though some moments we feel in good ways, very connected. But the struggles are the same, Jane, and that's what 
sometimes as organizers, and I don't want to paint everybody with a broad stroke, we have this exceptionalist attitude even as organizers. We do it better than they do it in prison. No, you don't. You can learn from them. Yeah. They have strategies that, that go more advanced than ours, man. You know? Yeah. Yeah, folks for sure are doing some kick-ass work everywhere. Johannesburg, right? E everywhere you look. So, oh, well, thank you guys for that. Um, uh, we have a little bit of time for um, about 20 minutes or so for Gopal and Linda to give us some questions out of the chat. And so, um, but, you know, of course, I just want to thank you guys. Um, I, I, I'm just, it, it's a beautiful thing. I, there are so many words I've tried to pull out of the things you were saying. You were talking about dreams and transformation. You were talking about practice and organizing every day, about resistance, about solidarity and, and perseverance. And, and so I just want to honor all of those ideas and that, you know, what you're bringing, you're bringing this compassion, creativity and love to the work. So super grateful for that. Um, so I think it's my chance to give it back to Gopal now um, and hear from some of sure. the folks who have joined us. Wonderful. So we have a, we have a few questions. Um, and um, I'll just start with the first one from um, uh, one of our dear friends, um, comrades and alumni. Um, Yolanda um, has this question. How can everyday community members begin to play a more aggressive role uh, to throw a wrench in the in the rapid developments that are occurring, that are gentrifying Black and Brown neighborhoods, um, aka past you know past redlined communities. So, just can you give us a little bit of like, what are the ways people can get involved in their communities um, around these questions of gentrification and housing and displacement? I think there are many community-based organizations doing great work. You're not going to do it alone. Uh, you build power by coming together. Uh, there were a hundred, under the de Blasio administration, there were over a hundred rezonings that were introduced. He's only accomplished three of them because we understood the process. We started to learn where it starts and it starts in New York at the community board level, right? Community boards are mostly appointed uh, members. So whose interests do they have in mind? the person that appointed them, not usually the community. So we've disrupted that process all over the city. If you don't vote in our favor, you won't, you won't be active because we're gonna bust it up. And it was a great example of that with Community Board 9 in Brooklyn, which was shut down for two years as they tried to upzone over Prospect Park. People got together, they realized how this process worked. Okay, we're gonna interfere. Every time a community board meeting happened, they went in there and disrupted. There were many arrests, but every time they went to have another meeting, it was busted up until all the community board members quit. Then the city government was ready to sit down with them. The developers were sitting down and you had conversations. So it takes a lot of different strategies and tactics, but I think you know, joining, there were dynamite community-based organizations all over the country. And just because I'm on the East Coast, I may be able to name, you know, West Coast organizations that you all don't know exist, right? Because it's it's what's inside of you. How much do you want to make change? And how much do you want that change to spread from, from ocean to ocean, right? So I'll stop there. Fanny, do you want to, Fanny, do you want to chime in on that? If not, we have another question that's specifically for you. Um, yeah, just really quickly, door knocking, it's um, old school, door knock, build relationships and engage your um, neighbors to be protagonists and reimagining and transforming the community. Danny, organize, 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 right? That's right. There's no getting around organizing. Yeah, that's the, I, I'm fond of saying, you know, people think campaigns don't change the world, organizing does. It's, it's the organizing. Um, so um, Fanny, I wanted to ask, we wanted to ask you a quick uh, question about, um, you know, there are lots of solutions that get proposed around how to deal with housing. Build more units, low income housing, um, uh, public housing, um, you know, uh, developer fees for affordable housing. And um, some of us have critiques of this, I know you do, <laughs> um, but also wanna hear sort of a little bit about your critiques of those and how you contrast sort of the work of, 
community land trusts and community controlled housing with those other kinds of approaches to quote unquote, just building more units? So what we're doing as the LA Fealty Coalition, we're building relationships with community development or, um, organizations, CDC um, corporations, you know, and we're not competing with each other. We're working collectively. So like Fide Comiso, we don't have the resources to, we don't have a real estate, you know. We were able to fundraise the first year of the pandemic, um, uh, the one, a little bit over a million dollars. And that was what gave us the funding to hire the first um, staff and the half person. And, uh, but we also need um, needed support with the acquisition. So we are partnering with other organizations to get the work done um, so instead of competing for funding, we're working collectively and supporting each other. And, and I believe that's how we should be doing. I think that was a lesson that we learned as soon as the pandemic started, um, the Healthy LA Coalition started, which is really huge. You know, we have organizations um, that are working in, in, in making sure that the most vulnerable have um, a safe way of, uh, surviving the pandemic. And so part of the work we do as Fide Comiso, we're also part of the Council Rent Collective. And so all of us are like in different spaces. So I know tomorrow I'll be with SD1, um, making sure that they know what's going on with the Economic Rental Assistance Program. Um, but that's one way, you know, we're just engaging in different spaces and making sure that we bring those resources to our communities. Um, and part of that is, you know, working with other organizations to make things happen. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the Cancel Rent Collective. I think that that that's another movement that really during the pandemic has, um, it, you know, really grown and exploited. Oh, another Glenn is joining us. Um, sorry, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I wanna um, uh, ask one more question here. Um, uh, Rob, for you in particular, I think um, you spoke a little bit about take back, that maybe, it's obvious that this question is coming from me. Um, uh, you spoke a little bit about take back the land um, in, term, in terms of the big vision, but can you share a little bit about the strategy and tactics and kind of um, that, um, that bit of work? And then um, I'm also gonna invite both of you to share like um, other inspiring organizations that you know of, it doesn't matter where they are, but in addition to your own, like other work that you think is really inspiring. Um, but can you share a little bit more just about the strategy of Take Back the Land? Yeah, so that was uh, fundamental for me. That was my indoctrination into underground organizing and real, real high level resistance, right? So the idea behind um, Take Back the Land was our tax money went to bail out banks and those banks started foreclosing and evicting us in record numbers. Right, so the banks got bailed out as the song went and we got sold out, right? But what was egregious about that, particularly in a place like New York, you when you buy a home, you have to buy an insurance policy that guarantees you're gonna pay off the mortgage, right? So if I can't, for whatever reason, I lost my job, I can't pay it off. The bank evicts me after putting me through foreclosure court, they keep the house, right? They got paid off by, by the federal government and the house is put back on the market. So we were evicted in record numbers. And it was mostly people of color and mostly women. So we organized ourselves around the country. We didn't have funding. Um, we basically said, we're gonna have local action groups, groups that around the country that agreed to the ideology, fundamental ideology of take back the land and did a certain methodology, nonviolent direct action. Um, we engage with certain groups. We did not have conversations with the financial institutions that forcefully evicted us. We would direct them to our partners, which were groups like the US Human Rights Network, the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York that always intimidated a lot of these banks. You know, They would call us and want to deal with, no, you need to talk to Center for Constitutional Rights. And then we ramped it up, right? And those local action groups existed around the country with myself and Max basically supporting them from distant locations. But as I said earlier, our fundamental goal was to get those foreclosed housing put into a community land trust. 
we almost got there on the West Coast, folks, with Gail McLaughlin. Um, for those of you on the West Coast, the mayor of Richmond, she came up with this idea. She's going to take back these foreclosed houses from Bank of America and all these banks and use eminent domain. They used the government's tool against the government. It was great. But uh, she ended up getting attacked by, you know, banks and, and big business pushing back on her. But we, you know, we learned from that methodology. And I think, you know, that the partnerships, the the methodology that we use to to do our work uh, was influential with a lot of groups. I think we we organized with Occupy um, the Occupy movement to form Occupy Our Homes. The folks in Occupy said, "Listen, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. You all have been doing this work. We'd like to collaborate with you," and that built a movement that was nationally and expanded the work a little bit. I, I you know, it was based on resistance, and when we ramped it up, at one point we really ramped it up after a couple of evictions and we and we were focusing on Bank of America. We said to Bank of America at one point, if you evict Fannie's family and family lives in and Fannie lives in Richmond, the closest bank to fam to Fannie's house that is a Bank of America branch will not do any business. We will make sure that that bank branch is shut down. And that got the banks wanting to talk and negotiate with us at pretty high levels. But again, we push back on the banks. You need to talk to our strategic partners. Our biggest victory came um, against Bank of America with a house in Rochester, New York. It's well documented. I put in the, there's some documents that'll be passed around to you folks. There's a, you know, an eviction defense that was done in Rochester. Uh, Catherine Lennon's family was forced out of the house with the SWAT team. But Mother's Day that spring, we moved it back in with a happy Mother's Day action, very public move-in, what we call the cops, called the press. And it was impressive in that community. As you see the film, you'll see people walking with refrigerators on their back with a couch to refurnish a house. The community all came together to support this family. And eventually, we negotiated with Bank of America, and they gave us the house to make us go away. Um, they gave it to us for the, the cost of $1. But, you know, it was just to, you know, say that they got something. When they evicted Catherine, they wanted 50000 in cash. But we took them through court and took them through a whole process. And they just wanted us to go away. And they just gave us the house. And today, Catherine is still living in that house happily ever after. So. Great. Thank you for sharing, Rob. Um, I will ask one of the questions that came in through the chat from one of our community members. So. Um, and maybe Fanny can start off by answering this question. Um, what role, if any, do you see for strategies and actions like squatting or occupations in the movement to establish CLTs? Um, I'm thinking of actions like the occupation of empty houses in El Serrano or the community that developed in Echo Park before the recent sweep. I think it's important. Um, I, I, it goes back to what Rob just mentioned about taking over empty houses. It's like the actions for moms for housing in Oakland I think that's what kind of you know motivated here in El Sereno too, yeah, and I know that in Philadelphia also there's um, some homes that were empty and a CLT that just started over there are they actually started squatting in um, homeless folks that were being evicted. Um, so it's important. It's direct action, and sometimes you just have to do it, but you have to plan it out well uh, in order for that to to transition in a way where people are not going to get hurt, uh, especially right now during the pandemic, um, and making sure that people are taken care of, you know, making sure that they don't get arrested and that they do that there's a plan to get them out of there right away. You know, I, I think a direct action is always important, but in a strategic manner where you know what's going to happen and how it's going to happen um, to make sure that you acquire um, the ultimate goal. Just to share a quick little bit of history, one of my mentors, of the which there were many, is Frank Morales, an Episcopal priest. He is now retired, but Frank is a longtime squatter with a collective on the Lower East Side of Manhattan that had claimed 11 buildings in 1979, and they still control those 11 buildings in 2021. So I, you know, um, and also Fanny was chatting me up about Brazil. One of the things that's famous in Sao Paulo is the banner hanging from a multi-story building. I've been in some of those buildings. The European Squatters Collective operates that way, builds social centers inside clinics, schools, libraries. So yeah, it's it's a methodology that you know I'd love to see 
employed. We couldn't get off the ground in New York. And even with Take Back the Land, we didn't have a local action group. But I always said, give me 25 soldiers and I'll take over a multi-story building in Manhattan any day of the week. Great. Um, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, I just wanted to <laughs> just, there's so much great, great stuff happening and people are just sharing so many um, amazing uh, examples and thank you for bringing up some of the um, inspirations for you there, Rob. Um, Fanny, I just wanted to invite you to share um, a few other, like other organizations that you want to point people to or other things that you find inspiring and then, um, yeah, and then we're going to um, invite our friend uh, Monique to um, to close this out, but I would love to hear a little bit of your your inspirations as well. So, um, so we started for the Comiso Comunitario Tierra Libre, and on our second year, I um, I thought it was essential for us to be part of the Community Land Trust Network, and so I became a member um, in January of 2020, right before the pandemic. <laughs> um, I think it's important for us to be. Uh, placing ourselves speci specifically for people of color as a woman of color uh, to be in spaces where we normally haven't had access uh, in order for us to create a lasting impactful change um, and to be able to bring the resources to our communities. Um, so I think um, that's one one space that I think um, we're working on transforming. Um, as I mentioned, three out of the five local C Los Angeles CLTs are in the board. Um, and that's where we met and strategically started talking about how we can uh, fundraise and bring um, policies that would uh, change the narrative, the extractive narrative from tenants and landlords that is you know, happening right now. And it's been happening historically. Um, and so, that's one space. Um, and also we're also members of the Healthy LA Coalition. Um, and um, yeah, and I think it's important to uplift that uh, Little Tokyo Services is um, the CDC that's working with us in acquiring our first building um, in, in the unincorporated East LA. And yeah, those are the organ And also I'm a member organizer for Community Power Collective. It's an organization that was born during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I'm excited because these are people that I've been organizing for years. Um, and I, it's important for us to, to trust that we're gonna get the work done and why we're doing it. Um, and also I'm a member of Left Roots. It's a cadre organization um, that's given me the skills to learn about how to be a true cadre member and strategically uh, implement, you know, the work that I'm doing in any space. So I'm excited, you know. Um, I feel comfortable and I'm really feeling gifted to be in this space. I, I learned a lot from you guys or all of you guys. Um, and I would like to continue learning from you guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, those are the only organizations that I'm going to uplift other than the, the CLTs that we're working collectively. Well, Liberty Hill um, is one of them uh, with my sister Sarita, who is leading grandmas for Crenshaw. And then uh, we have Trust Off the LA, who I'm working collectively right now with the Economic Rental Assistance Program and also building those relationships because we want to connect directly with our community and uh, you know, bring those resources and then engage them to become um, active protagonists in the way we wanna transform our communities. And yeah, and it is important that we recognize that we are in Tongaba land. Um, I am, I, I have been meeting directly with Mama Gloria, um, but we don't know how that would look. Um, I know that she was going to be talking to the chief. I also took Sarita to introduce her and they met and they talked. Um, but I know that El Sereno is doing the work. They've actually have a, a committee 
where they have members of the Tongaba clan. Um, I haven't been able to participate in that space because, you know, as as I mentioned, I wear multiple hats. I'm also a single mom and, um, you know, I have to do so much work and also with the California CLT network and locally and regionally, but yeah, um, it's, it's gonna happen, you know, the, the, I'm hoping that um, that eventually we bring uh, the indigenous folks to engage with the LACLT coalition. Um, I've mentioned that with Mama Gloria, but I haven't met with her in maybe a couple of weeks or so. But um, that's work that's happening. Um, I know that El Serrano's probably leading it. Um, I've just, I've done as far as introducing myself. And yeah. then someone was asking that, oh, Tina. So we're working on it, Tina. <laughs> we're working on, on bringing um, the, in, the voices of, of the indigenous folks. I think it's important. Oh, so she, Tina is a, uh, she's part of the, is it El Sereno CLT? Um, yeah, so I, I haven't been able to participate in the meetings. I was invited, but I haven't um, been able to participate. I know that you guys hold it every Wednesday, um, but I'm ready and willing whenever I'm available, whenever I get the invite as well again. <laughs> yeah, but I know, thank you, Rob. Um, this is the first time that I, um, that I actually am doing this presentation on my own um, and talking about the work I'm doing in my individual, like the CLT locally and regionally. Um, so I don't have much experience in the presentation. So I really uh, I'm feel gratified to have gotten your positive comments. Um, yeah, thank you. And no problem. And you just keep using that word transform. There are not too many organizers that usually use it, right? I want to do transformation. I don't want to reform anything. We want to change and we have a vision for something different. I yeah. just appreciate that so much. Thank you, appreciate it. Hey, um, well, thank you so much, Fanny and Rob for um, just sharing with us, inviting us into your work. Um, and also thanks to Jane for facilitating the conversation. Um, and I want to hand it over now to Monique Lopez, um, who is faculty and, and our interim program chair for the urban sustainability um, program at Antioch. Thank you, Linda. And so now is time for the sweet part of our evening. Um, we are um, going to offer up much gratitude to uh, Fanny and Rob for being here today. Um, I've learned an incredible amount from you both and also have been deeply inspired. Um, as well, and appreciate the questions. Um, very, very mindful and you know, caring questions um, that folks asked in the chat today. Um, I also want to offer up some gratitude for for Jane and for for Clarence and Linda and Gabriella and um, Gopal who helped make this evening um, as sweet it, as it as it was this uh, tonight. Um, I also want to share in the chat box um, our, and I do see a lot of familiar faces here, which is beautiful. Um, and also um, people that, that I, I don't know as well. And if you'd like to learn more about the urban sustainability um, program at Antioch, I encourage you to click on that link. Um, I know that students can attest to the fact that these are the conversations um, that we engage in the classroom and outside of classroom space um, as well. And we grapple with these complex issues and we bring in community members who are truly the experts on these things um, as well. And so I encourage you, if you don't have a current relationship um, with the Urban Sustainability Program to please reach out to, to us and check out that link. And um, we'd love to have you as a student um, um, we'd love to have you as part of the community um, at Antioch University. We do these sustainable suppers, which are open to the public. Um, and we also do community workshops. We just finished a three-part series on nurturing communities from food insecurity to food sovereignty that um, we just wrapped up yesterday, which Gopal was, was facilitating. Um, and so we do these things in, in, as an act of reciprocity 
and gratitude for the community, the broader community that we're in, um, and, and to really bring in um, folks in the broader community um, into our small community as well. So as we transition from dessert, if you're like me, I, you know, after a dinner party, I typically put a kettle on, put some tea or coffee, um, and kind of stay a little bit longer in chat. So if you're feeling up to it, um, we're going to transition to our um, coffee conversation, um, where we'll be able to engage in a more informal conversation with other folks that are here. If you are um, finding it a long day, um, you can certainly take your coffee to go and we hope to see you next time as well. But um, if you'd like to stay, what we'll do now is we'll break out into smaller breakout sessions so we can engage in conversations at our um, small virtual coffee table. Um, and I believe we're going to have um, two channels available, right, Jane, if you could share a little bit about how that transition is going to work. Um, sure. Yes, absolutely. So we'll keep the main room open with the uh, interpretation. Um, so we'll continue to have English Spanish in the main room and we will have one or two uh, English language uh, breakout rooms with um, uh, casual conversation. So not official, no prompts, but if folks would love to stay, that would be fantastic. And just to hear from you all, your stories, your questions. That would be so great. So we're going to play a little three minute video as soon as Monique says we should and then uh, the breakout rooms will come to you in a minute. My coffee's ready so go for it Jane. Thank you. The moral imperative that relates to whether or not people. I don't think the screen share is happening yet Jane. Not yet. moral imperative that relates to whether or not people have a right to live in the side of a house. Take the houses back, 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 take the houses back. They belong to the people, take the houses back. Take the house back, baby, take the house back. Take the house back, baby, take the house back. We don't gotta go get nobody's mouse trap. We got what we need in our community. Grab the keys in your hand, unlock that. Get a crowbar and just rock that. Let's meet at the bank and just crowd that. Show at least that we know where the power's at. Right here. Making houses, turn them into homes. Let your mental roam like a signal phone. It's true indeed. There's a human need. People on the street and the crib's empty. This ain't no baby, babe. Ain't no ass to shake. Just to open and bail. Get the class away. Cause we mad as hell. Man, it's cold as hell. We some northern soldiers. They made us yell. To my southern cousins, let's take it there. On the coast, provoke. Protect your peace. Occupy our homes. Let's play for keeps. Let's roll the dice. This game is deep. Take abandoned lots. Make them guard and plots. Then guard them plots. Cause the block is hot. Unbar the lots. Then watch for cops. When we get together, we're hard to stop. Take the house back, baby. Take the house back. Take the house back, baby. Take the house back. We don't gotta go get nobody's mouse trap. We got what we need in our community. Grab the keys in your hand. Unlock that. Get a crowbar and just rock that. Let's meet at the bank and just crowd that. Show at least that we know where the power's at. The cost of living is going up. Chances, Chances of living are going, going down. down. The cost of living is going up. Chances of living are going down. The needs of the many must always outweigh the needs of the few. We got the mamas, papas, attorneys, rockers, kids in the fosters, vets and doctors, black flag activists, gramps and nomads, grannies, big old families, old men. If we can't fix the problem this way, this way, or this way, it's legal. We have no trouble in doing illegal. Everybody need a place to kick back. When you get yours, then it's time to give back. Say we can't wait, man. Get your rebate, man. Everybody eat and come grab your plate, man. My granny and my uncle and my aunt used to share a crib. Where you live, it's no embarrassment. There you is. She got a 
house when she wrote that check and he got a house went to court and shit they kept their spot when the folks protest my man got his spot for a buck and a lease when the bank's foreclosure game ain't over i came to the office they march like soldiers like what's wrong baby girl bring your dog back grab your gym shoes you right bring it all back no trouble baby brother grab your ball back get your comic books come on grab all that take the house back baby take the house back take the house back baby take the house back we don't gotta go get nobody's mouse trap we got what we need in our community grab the keys in your hand unlock that get a crowbar and just rock that that's me at the bank and just crowd that show the least that we know where the power's at right here Okay, one more minute for the rooms, please. Not wasn't the way we wanted it to be. All right, if you all haven't, if you all haven't gotten a room assigned, um, shout out. Again, the main room is the, um, Monique, maybe if you would stay in the main room, that would be great. Thank you. I can stay wherever you guys want me or wherever you want, want to put me at. Fanny, do you want to stay in the bilingual room? Sure. Then mm -hmm. you didn't, don't, don't choose a room, just stay in the main. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, we have uh, Harold, Gabriela, Francisco, Lupe, Mariana are here in the room with us. Um, I'd love to hear from folks um, uh, just, you know, what's maybe one of the biggest takeaways that, that you had tonight or something that you'd like to maybe explore even further. Also, Fanny, um, was there anything maybe that Rob shared? I, I don't know if this is the first time you, you uh, met Rob? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm, oh, yeah. awesome. I also would love to hear from you too. Um, was there anything maybe that Rob said that that um, piqued your curiosity or you want to explore a little bit further as well? Uh, yeah, I one of the things that I've been itching for is the direct action in, in um, squatting homes, houses, especially because um, a lot of my, the community members have been fighting displacement. Um, we've had members who had been displaced, not only from, the state, but from the country, um, because they didn't have access to a job in the state that they ended up moving. Um, and, you know, to know that there's so many empty houses and we have so many people that need to have housing with dignity. I mean, just what happened with the pandemic, uh, many of our neighbors got infected with COVID and, you know, they put their family at risk because one, they had to work to pay the rent. And then two, the living conditions are like really bad because, you know, you have a one bedroom or a single unit and you have four or five people living there. And, um, and then you have all these empty houses that should be spotted and, you know, reclaimed by community. So that's one thing I would like to learn <laughs> more Absolutely. about. 
Gabriella, it looked like you were going for the unmute button. Um, no, I was just actually trying to like orient my computer, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure I really have uh, like a direct question. I'm, I'm processing so much. I just want to say, Fanny, thank you for everything that you shared. This is an issue that is just <clears throat> super close to my heart. Um, and maybe one thing I will ask since you are an LA local, um, do you know of like affordable housing options for people who, you know, are struggling, who are needing to move, who um, <clears throat> like some routes that people can go or resources or, or, or places to check into for that? Um, so what Fidecomiso is doing, we, one of our members, and including myself last year, we were distributing uh, boxes of food. Um, but so we're all supporting each other. We're doing it on Fridays. Um, and we're also using that as a, as a tool to engage with community and let them know the work we're doing um, and invite to do a talk. So I spent three days out there. I got to speak to the Nez First Nation talking about indigenous folks. Um, I got to have a conversation with them, but the very first day I spoke to a high school sociology class and I realized the power of storytelling. I thought I thought about it prior to that, but it really had an effect on me when I shared my story in this high school sociology class. And we had some back and forth Q&A when we were done and the students are leaving. And I noticed one girl lagging behind the rest of the students. And she looks at me and she just comes up and she gives me a big hug and she goes, thank you. And she whispers in my ear, me and my family slept in a car for seven months. And, you know, she never told anybody that story. You know, she probably felt it was safe when I told the teacher what she told me. The teacher said, nobody knew that story, right? So you made her feel comfortable. And I realized the power of storytelling there. And then the second time, well, this was actually the first time in 2009, I got to visit Hungary as a member of Picture the Homeless. And there was a student at the CUNY Grad Center who was following around the organization and wanted to set up a similar organization in Budapest, Hungary. And that organization exists today. It's called Ibarish Mendenke. But we did a series of talks. We spent 20 days in Hungary. And uh, it, midway through our travels, we went a seaside community in the south of Hungary called Zaget. And every morning we get up, we give a series of talks. And, you know, I talk about some of the root causes of homelessness, how it's a societal issue that was forced on individuals. And the translator, like we had translators today, I had an earpiece in my ear and the translator is, is translating the reaction of somebody in the audience. And then a man goes, what? And for 51 years, I'm, I've been blaming myself. And this guy says it's not my fault. There was a man in the audience who had been homeless on the streets as a get since he was in diapers for 51 years. And all of a sudden I came down and gave this talk and it was like a relief to him. At the end of the, at the, end of the talk, he came and he grabbed me and he was just holding me and shaking for like five minutes. Everybody kept saying, push him away. I'm not pushing him away. I'm, imagine carrying something like that for 51 years. And then all of a sudden you got that weight off your shoulders. So, you know, for me, the power of storytelling has always been an important component of the work. And I realized, you know, it's okay to people. And that's what drove me to this work. All the narratives that, that were painted of why you're homeless, right? Homeless because you don't want to work, homeless because you don't have an education, homeless because you have a chemical or an alcohol addiction, homeless because you have mental, like none of that stuff fit me. And it irritated me that I would be painted with that broad brush. So, you know, I just think it's important for people to share their stories. And so I always try to give a little bit of that background every time I do an event like this. Bravo, thank you. Sure. Relief, that's what I felt, relief. There you go. I just want to say really quickly, I, I actually, the last thing you said, I think is really important. I really appreciate this, you know, this general problem of, um, you know, th that the idea that we define the problem as being about the pathology of an individual. And if, you, you know, without actually like looking at systemic patterns, systemic drivers, all of those things. And that's, that's the control mythology. That's, you know, it's like the story you tell can be liberating, but there are these dominant stories that we've all assimilated. Even those of us who don't, don't accept them as legitimate still have them, you know, we still, we still walk around with them. And, um, and, and those, and the, the, 
the the lie of those stories is revealed not just in the larger analysis, but in the very pragmatic thing of like, what have we found works best for addressing um, substance abuse um, and um, or self medication among people who are houseless? Permanent housing, like. That's right. You know, the, the rule used to be you had to get cleaned up in order to qualify for housing. And now we know that actually putting people in housing is the easiest way for people to get the support right. they need to get cleaned up. It's like, duh, you know, but, um, but it's because we've assimilated this deep control mythology that pathologizes individuals and ignores patterns. Um, you know, that. So I think I think that's really important, both the power of the individual story, but the power of the individual story to shed light on the larger structures and, and patterns. That's, Gopal, that was the important part for me to bring others in, right? So it was my job to find other people who had a similar experience and open up to them so that we could build our collective power to say, look, this is what happened and this is how it happened. That narrative doesn't fit me, right? You know, I, I think that's just so, so important, right? So. I wish there was some, um, you know, workshop or classes or <laughs> like a script or something because what because people do all you know people who come to LA and visit and say bad you have such a problem here we don't have a problem wherever we come from you know where do they come from and 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 if I try to talk to them in these grander bigger Either they're not listening or they go, they turn me off like I'm a born again something, you know, like, oh, like I don't get it or I'm too sympathetic and they're not listening. We're all listening, right? All of us today, we're listening. But I wish I had a script that could help open up people's eyes. I can't just drag Gopal with me everywhere on a plane, you know, <laughs> and hear him talk the way, you know, he talks the big picture. I, so part of part of organizing, um, Catherine is 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 sharing and creating space where people feel safe to open up. Right, that's a big part of it. I think uh, the more we create spaces like that, the more this stuff will come out of people. And you know, it was two young storytellers in New York that thought my story was powerful when I didn't think it was a big deal. I was a member of Picture the Homeless, and they did a recording of it, and that recording was shared as part of a, a series of stories called Housing is a Human Right. Mm -hmm. And it was premiered in laundromats around New York City. So when they first premiered it, I went to the first laundromat. I didn't announce anybody who I was. I just wanted to see it. You know how people sit in the laundromat and watch their clothes go around in a circle? <laughs> Everybody's ears were pinned to the speakers. I was like mesmerized by the reactions in the room. They were listening to these stories and it just, it had just embedded in my head the power of storytelling and how powerful that really is. And so I think, you know, we have to get away from these narratives. The other one that I spend is home ownership is the way to wealth through all that I've been through. It's 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 a oh. narrative, but it's not true. And we have to get away from that, but we have to do it by having people share their stories. You know, I would argue, and this is the argument I make when I'm in classrooms, it's the way you know, we have direct contact with the attorneys who are having direct contact with either the city and then like tomorrow I'll be participating with the SD1 uh, meeting with um, Hilda Solista to let them know what's, you know, what's the system is failing us. So I'm gonna ask like, you know, we need to seek the debt, you know, so we're gonna escalate on our ask. I think um, that's important coming directly from community uh, and um, being able to, to bring those those messages directly to people who have power, um, you know. Yeah, I we um, I, I live in San Diego, and um, I was just recently hearing that there's millions of dollars in rental assistance that the housing commission thinks will go unused, and and it's not because the need isn't there; it's because they're not doing a good job with outreach. Um, yeah. the, the, the mechanisms in which, you know, an English website that people, do, one, don't even know the resources there. Um, and so as soon as the moratorium is lifted, you're going to have mass evictions with millions of dollars left on the table to that was specifically put there to help 
you know, people and, and prevent people from, from being evicted. And so, um, and then, and then here locally, they put this, this, I don't know if it's statewide or just local, but, um, because housing is such a, like affordable housing is such a crisis here that oftentimes you have two or three families living in one, one household and they kind they, they pay the landlord, like, you know, each, the, the way this program is set up is that only one, um, one family in, or one household they consider in per address is able to apply for the program. And so that's excluding a whole bunch of people that were already in a dire situation. And that's why they're living in, 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 in overcrowded housing. They're excluding those individuals because you can't, you can't apply for the rental assistance using um, the same address multiple times, um, even though they're not, they're not cheating the system. They're just really trying to access that support and help. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of things that, we're seeing here locally that oh. it's yeah yeah i know last year that was an issue and we brought it up because there's folks that um rent rooms especially folks from the non-informal economy they rent rooms so that was brought up to the county and to the to the city as well uh, but that's a, that's a good point um because they should be able to apply for the economic rental assistance because at the end of the day they're still you know they're still a tenant they're still paying you know um their, their rental but yeah there's so many technical issues as well with arab um uh, today in the morning i was trying to help this one lady she had everything but the system was not recognizing her email the second time it wasn't recognizing or accepting the digits for the the amount that she owed for every month and so, you know, me being savvy, I just wrote a note, took a picture and I uploaded it, but it didn't take it anyways. I tried a second time, it still didn't go, but apparently, you know, this is something that it's ongoing. The second person I was able to help, it didn't also accept the, the digits for the rental amount of money that she owes. But so I sent an email to the attorney and, you know, said this is what's happening. Um, they're telling us to send the, the tenants to call this 800 number so they can do it over the phone, but the phone lines are so satur saturated, they're not even picking up anymore. Um, wow. So um, we were like, Fideicomiso is taking like uh, the initiative on letting both the county of LA and the city of LA to know that our members are going to be uh, at risk of being evicted uh, uh, because the system is failing them. And so, you know, either you do something or you seize the debt. Um, and that's, um, that's another action like, mm -hmm. that's going to start. So we're going to be leaning. <laughs> Penny, I'll reach that's out sure. to you about that particular issue. We have some great tactics and strategies that are happening here and 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 are successful. So I'll reach out to you separately. Oh, sweet, thank you. That'll be amazing. Yeah, and then you can talk to me about squatting because I'm ready for that too. I mean, if I didn't if I didn't have my special needs daughter, I, I would have been already squatting at home, but you know, yeah. but I'd be yeah. like, you know, I'll talk to my daughter. I'm like, hey, go, go take over this, you know? Well, this is why, <laughs> community needs to support community. We need to create some space to have these conversations about why and what is, what's the reasoning behind it. But we can talk some more. I will definitely reach out to you, so. Thank you, Rob. Just text me your, your name first because I usually don't tend to answer unless I recognize the number. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who it is. Do I owe you money? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, what, back in the days of Take Back the Land, um, you know, we were we we created a direct action curriculum for people. That's that's was part of my part of my role was training and and putting together curriculum for how to occupy space. And um and I think that th like what you were saying, Penny, like the thing that's really important about Moms for Housing in Oakland was it wasn't one family or one individual trying to do it for themselves, which a lot of adverse possession direct action is based on the individual taking action and trying to lay low long enough that they can get the adverse possession law, which is in California now is seven years. New York used to be six months, that, that went away a long time ago, but 
and you used to be able to actually squat a place for six months and then get adverse possession. Um, and so I bring this all up because I think the the solution is really in that like collective action. Those those four mothers, and one of them had also has a a, a child with um, with different different needs, and um, but it's because they had a community of people that could do it. They could pull it off, and of course, a lot of support. The bank wasn't, you know, it was that thing, Rob, that you were saying. It's like we can easily do fifty thousand dollars worth of we can make fifty thousand dollars worth of trouble for a bank. It's definitely easier for them to give you the house. You know, like it, you can make enough trouble, um, but it takes organizing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you guys ever met Sarita Jones? She's from the Liberty CLT. She's, um, she actually shared with me that she was the one that um, prepared the moms for housing in Oakland. And she also was uh, training the folks here in El Sereno. I'm like, oh, that was you? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's my girl. <laughs> good night y'all thank you thank you all so much i was that was really great i don't know who all else is still with us but um and i and we should also thank mariana and lupe i i was just going to say that i you know, yes, i'm a please. monolingual speaker lupe lupe no lupe and i got a little bit of history <laughs> but mariana thank you appreciate y'all and i know i tend to pop 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 so <laughs> You'll only warn me once, so I guess I did a pretty good job, so thank you. But I really appreciate y'all, so thank you. See. Everybody, thanks again That's for inviting me. Fanny, you and I will collaborate. Jane, Gopal, I'll reach out to you. We'll continue some conversations, and this is this is fascinating for me. I really, I really enjoy the relationships, and I build upon them. So Gopal knows I stay in touch with folks, man. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody says, how do you know all these people all around the world? I mean, <laughs> get your contact information and we're friends forever <laughs> so, everybody stay safe be well um and thanks again for having me all right thank you thank you guys you guys thank may you you. bye thanks bye thanks harold thank you very much thanks wonderful another wonderful night Yes, definitely. And Jane, thank you for all of your organizing work and for putting all of the details together. This, this came together so beautifully. Mariana and Lupe.